Ravens kind of have a big game coming up against the Bengals this Sunday, and it is a must-win game for Baltimore. Because right now, the way the standings are set up, they find themselves on the outside looking in. Uh, but to talk about this game, to talk about the different aspect, the different viewpoint of the Cincinnati Bengals, I had to bring in an expert. Because I'm certainly no expert on the Cincinnati Bengals. I mean, I'm no expert on anything, really. Uh, so shout out to our special guest who we have coming on. And, and let's hear what he has to say, his viewpoint, his perspective on this Bengals Ravens matchup. Yeah, this feels like a dream. And you know just what I mean. You see my boy, he like gotta made it, how to made it. Boy, he's a fan, and he like the Ravens, like the Ravens. And you know just So you two team keep it clean. We got a very special guest in the building uh to talk about this upcoming Bengals game this Sunday. It's my guy Anthony from the Orange and Black Inside of Bengals podcast. Appreciate you joining us today. How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm a little starstruck being on your being on your channel here. You are you are wow. the man. Uh, I appreciate you having me on though. This uh, this is a big one to talk about, big game to talk about. So uh, I'm doing all right, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I appreciate you asking. And um, little concern because today <laughs> we're recording this on Thursday, Thursday afternoon, and it just came out again that Lamar Jackson did not practice. But um, we will uh, we'll talk about that shortly. First. Um, where can everybody find you at? Twitter, YouTube, podcasts, websites, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm on Twitter at CJ Anthony CUI. I am one of the hosts of the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. As you mentioned, that's on Twitter at Bengals OBI. It's on uh, av available on all audio platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, all that stuff. And then we've got a YouTube channel as well. So all that stuff, and then it's housed on CincyJungle.com, which is part of the SB Nation Sports Blog Network. All right, cool. Appreciate you letting everybody know. How often do you post? How often do, do you get videos and everything like that? Yeah, so we do um, – in season, we're doing something almost – kind of every day of the week it's it's mm -hmm. you know we got kind of a, a headlines around the league type of show we've got our own kind of deep dive analysis show midweek we do some fantasy football stuff some post game stuff so um <clears throat> you know we're bringing we're bringing stuff throughout the throughout the regular season a, a lot of days during the week and then you know draft season we're doing draft profiles pro prospect profiles all kinds of different stuff as well so kind of cool. trying to keep it fresh doing different stuff yeah i feel you now how did you become a Bengals fan <laughs> well, I became a Bengals fan because of my older brother. Uh, and when when he was, I'm probably dating myself here, but when he was a little bit uh, of a young guy, the Bengals went to a couple Super Bowls in the 1980s. He got into them. He had no previous affiliation. We're from Southern California, so we're not from the Cincinnati area. We're not from Ohio. And mm -hmm. he liked the helmets. He liked that they were good at the time and uh, got, got me into him because he had a little brother. And then he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed the obsession with this guy. And then he actually was <laughs> the one who encouraged me to start doing kind of some writing and podcasting and stuff. So, oh, that's um, cool. yeah, yeah. So uh, that was kind of the, the deal. And then that now podcasting and writing just takes it to a whole other level. But that's that's another story for another time, I guess. <laughs> OK. And now what has been your absolute favorite moment as a Bengals fan? Oh, man. Um, there's so many heartbreaking moments. It's hard to pick out a, a good one. Uh, you know, um, I, I will say my favorite moment of a bang as being a Bengals fan, um, 2015 was, it was a pretty, pretty fun season. I will say though, going back to 2005 when the Bengals really seemed to kind of arrive under Marvin Lewis and they were winning games and Carson Palmer looked like the real deal. And mm -hmm. at that point it had been such a long stretch since they, since they were even competitive, Mm -hmm. um so i mean 2003 they had a decent year and then uh 2005 was just a really really fun year it's hard to pick out a singular moment there but th the 2005 season for me was just kind of like hey this is this is probably going to be the start of something special and it sort of was for a little bit but uh a little bit short-lived unfortunately uh, yeah it happens now uh with no pressure i know you couldn't quite pick an exact greatest moment as a Bengals fan but who has been your favorite Bengals player You know, I, I'll, I'll go first. Mine okay. would be Ocho Cinco, Chad oh, yeah. Johnson. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of easy. Biggie. One, but yeah. yeah, that's a biggie. Um, you know, I, I really, even though I caught 
my watching football watching time uh, caught the latter part of his career. I really, really like and respect Anthony Munoz. That's a pretty e- easy answer. The team's only Hall of Fame player, but he's been on my show a couple times, and he does a lot of stuff in the community, and um, he still kind of does all kinds of different stuff revolving around the team, and even when they were terrible, he was always a good, um, you know, kind of – diplomat for the team, I guess, if you will. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that was, and then of course my name is Anthony. So, you know, there's a, there's a direct <laughs> tie there too. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I would say uh, easy answer, Anthony Munoz. I mean, Chad's in there for sure. And, um, you know, there, there are a few others kind of more obscure references uh, of players, but yeah, I, I, I'll go easy on that one. All right, cool. So this game, Ravens, Bengals, of course, last time we played the ring, Bengals absolutely just, demolished us at, at our own crib too um so how are you feeling about the Bengals heading into this game with the ravens i have a lot of mixed emotions i mean there's a side of me where i feel pretty confident because of what happened in the first game i feel pretty confident because the ravens have such a battered roster at this mm-hmm. point for a variety of reasons injuries or covid whatever um so i mean and right now The Bengals have been up and down, but they're coming off of a win, a tough game in Denver. And so, you know, they've been a streaky team. So you like to think maybe they're kind of catching one of their hot streaks at the end of the year. Maybe they match up well against Baltimore. But I've said this before. When when does Baltimore lose four games in a row? Never. Never. And so, you know, I, I trust... You know, I like the direction that the Bengals are headed as an organization. I like what the management has done over the past couple of seasons, not only in free agency, but really kind of upping the fan experience and doing the things that normal organizations do. Mm -hmm. Um, But right now, if you kind of look at kind of uh, maybe this is me being a cynical Bengals guy that have watched has watched too much Bengals football. But for me, you know, what organization do you trust more? What organization has a better track record of success? Um, what, what team usually shows up a little bit more in bigger games that usually is the Ravens. That being said, the Bengals have brought in a lot of guys to try and change that culture and have started to do so. And I, that that starts Mm -hmm. with Joe Burrow and some of the free agency acquisitions. So mixed bag for me on this one. I understood. Now, um, Pro Bowl, the, the official Pro Mm -hmm. Bowl and, uh, rosters, they came out, uh, and I didn't see Joe Burrow's name. How do you feel about that? You know, on on a lot a lot of levels, I was a little disappointed. I feel like he was a guy that is deserving, um, and I, I feel that he's getting slighted a bit in a number of different ways. I think he's not really being talked about as comeback player of the year. I think he's not really being talked mm. about as a potential MVP candidate. And of course, he's he's an alternate as a Pro Bowler. But I mean, it's like okay, okay. well, thanks, but I mean. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's I, I feel like there's a little bit of a snub there going on with him. And there, there are three games to play out if this team gets into the postseason. I think maybe that chatter will pick up a little bit more. But Joe Burrow is the heart and soul of this team. And, and mm-hmm. you know, I know Jamar Chase has brought a nice dimension. The defense is playing a lot better than it has been. But Joe Burrow, this team really rallies around him. I wish he would have gotten a little more recognition. But that's also Joe Burrow. Right. I mean, he's the guy, if you could look back to his college career, he was slighted at Ohio State and he moved and transferred to LSU, didn't have the greatest first year as a starter at LSU, then goes and breaks records. Then he's the Heisman guy. Then he gets hurt as a first year as a pro. Is he going to come mm-hmm. back and play well? And lo and behold, he does. So yes. it's kind of, it, for me, it's, it's, it stinks that he doesn't get the recognition, but that Joe Burrow constantly has a chip on his shoulder. And I think this just builds it more and more. Um, he, and, and, just to kind of play devil's advocate as, from the Bengals side of things, I also he is up there in the league leaders in interceptions. So I mean, I, I understand that as well that that may play against him in terms of Pro Bowl voting. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't know because Lamar uh, he has I believe thirteen interceptions, and uh, yeah, he got in there. Yeah. So um, yeah, I always talk about with the Pro Bowl. It, it's fun. Uh, it's fun when you see some of your favorite players get voted in, um, and then you see some players that are deserving that don't get in. Um, but it definitely is a uh, a popularity contest for sure. Um, but it also does talk about uh, it does speak volumes to the respect that because it's not just all about the fan voting, 
Uh, it's also about players and coaches too. Uh, and it talks about the respect that uh, they have for the players that they vote into uh, the Pro Bowl. It's not definitely not the end all be all. Just mm-hmm. because somebody makes or doesn't make the Pro Bowl, it doesn't mean, oh, okay, well, this, this person is certified now since they made it, or this person is not certified now since they didn't make it. But it's just, just a fun little conversation uh, for us to have uh, as people that watch and for NFL right. to have uh, for people who watch. Now, um, Joe Burrow, this season, uh, he's been doing this thing. Y'all are sitting at eight and six right now. Um, what has been sort of the biggest difference from, and I know we only got a sample size last year, but what has been one of the biggest differences from Joe Burrow that you saw last year compared to the Joe Burrow right here, right now? The deep ball. The oh. deep ball and uh, the, and it's not just, you know, deep pa- or uh, passes that are, short passes that turn into yards after catch. There is a lot of air yards. Joe Burrow is, I believe he's tops in the NFL in terms of, um, you know, long ball passing this year. Mm -hmm. And so that was a a big criticism as a rookie. Does he have the arm strength? Can he push the ball down the field? Well, in fact, they just needed a different dimension to their offense and Jamar Chase. And it's not just Chase. T. Higgins is catching a, a few deep balls here and there. So is Tyler Boyd. CJ Uzama is making some big plays. So, I mean, there, there are a number of different weapons that he has used and really has brought about a deeper passing attack. With it does come increased chances that he's taken. And with that comes the interceptions that I mentioned before. But it also it comes with the big plays and it comes with some big wins and some big near wins when you look at the Green Bay game that they lost in overtime and all kinds of different things. So, um, you know, th- that to me is the biggest difference. And Joe Burrow's a guy where he has been making some mistakes in terms of forcing passes or, you know, maybe taking a shot downfield where it may not be there, but he just wants to pop the big play. But he's a guy that doesn't make the same mistake twice. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's, it's very rare that you see him commit stupid throws or, you know, hey, that, that's a bad play. And that one repeats itself a couple of games later. He really tries to learn from his mistakes and learns from, learns from his successes as well. And I think that's yeah. what makes him a, a budding star in the league. And, and that's definitely a good thing when, um, when a quarterback, especially so young, they can learn so much. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you talked about with him the deep ball improving, and it's led to some big wins and also some big almost wins. Um, and that just reminded me of a Raven saying that became very popular in 2019, and that was big trust. Now, uh, there's been a certain Bengal player uh, who, who mocked that. The last time the Bengals came and beat down the Ravens, uh, that being Mr. Eli Apple. And, and Eli, he was on Twitter, and he's been going back and forth with Ravens fans. And um, and he even said that uh, he's looking forward to Lamar Jackson being generous in this game, even though right now it's not looking like Lamar Jackson's even going to play. But do you feel like Eli Apple, um, do you feel like he sort of put – not even necessarily an extra target on his back, but he he's given the Ravens any extra motivation with the trash talk? Potentially, potentially. But I, I think if you look back at Eli Apple and his, not, not only his career as a whole, I mean, the guy was a mid middle of a first round pick, pretty high pick, pretty big disappointment in most of his career. He's actually playing his, what I feel is his best football with the Bengals this year. Started off on a really bad foot the first mm-hmm. month or so of the year. Uh, The defense was playing really well. And if you looked at kind of how the defense was playing, he was kind of the highlighted weak link of the defense. But he was also put in a position where he wasn't supposed to be a starting cornerback for this team. He was supposed to be about fourth or fifth down the depth chart. And, you know, now you look at it and he's put into a starting role because Trey Waynes has been out, uh, who is a starting boundary corner. And Chidobe Awuzie has been in and out of the lineup. So he's had to be uh, had to take on a bigger role than initially expected had some real tough times at the beginning of it. And then, you know, middle of the season started hitting a stride a little bit and started playing better down the stretch. Uh, you know, he, he talked about last week when he went up against Denver and he was partially responsible in covering Jerry Judy, who was blanked on the stat sheet. So, and he let people know about it. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's kind of feeling it. He's kind of talking and, and uh, I think he feels that he's playing some of his best football. There are people that probably don't like it. From the Ravens side, from the Bengals side, I understand that. Um, but I mean, the bottom line is, if he's going to put that out there, he needs he needs to play well, and right. uh, he's been playing well of late. But 
you know, any, things can change week to week. And like you said, if there is a target on his back, that's a guy that they, you know, if there is a play that is made on him, that will be made known for sure. Oh, yeah. So, it, it certainly will be. Because yeah, yeah. it sort of reminds me of, um, I believe his name was Jermaine Pratt. Yep. From from last year. Yep. That, that didn't quite work out so well. But, nope. hey, that's why the game got to be played, man. We got to see what, what goes down. That's right. Um, now, speaking of Bengals defense, uh, last year uh, you all had a um, an excellent up and coming defensive end slash outside linebacker. I'm not sure exactly which position he was. On edge, I just say that to be safe. Uh, Carl Lawson, um, and it was looking like uh, the Bengals they may hold on to him. I know a lot of Bengals fans wanted to hold on to him, but he ended up going to I think the New York Jets, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, and unfortunately, he ended up tearing his ACL. I want to say, yeah, it was. either that or his Achilles or something. Yeah, it was ah, something yeah. pretty pretty bad. Yeah. So that ended his season. But um, on the flip side, the Bengals signed a guy uh, from the New Orleans Saints, um, Trey Hendrickson, and he has absolutely been killing it. How has he looked to you, uh, and what has he done for this Bengals defense this year? Dominant effort, mm -hmm. effort, effort. And this was a guy that when Bengals fans saw Carl Lawson go bye-bye because of a little bit of a disagreement on guaranteed money and the Bengals went right away at Trey Hendrickson, they, uh, Bengals fans were freaking out in a negative way. They thought that this was a terrible move. Trey Hendrickson had a lot of sacks last year, but a lot of folks looked at it and said um, – this was a guy that had a lot of cleanup sacks, uh, coverage sacks, wasn't really a guy who had a lot of moves and was kind of the benefactor of, of other players around him, essentially. That's why his stats were so gaudy last last year. And he has come in here and shut everyone up. Uh, he is among the league leaders in pressures. He is among the league leaders in sacks. He got a Pro Bowl nod, rightfully so. He set a, a franchise record for a, a sack or at least a half sack in 10 straight games. Um, and he's he's just playing outstanding, and he's a guy who's a movable piece a little bit. They move him around a tiny bit, but he he actually what they've done is they've I every time I look at the snap counts throughout the week, I'm thinking he's going to be upwards of 90 to 100 percent of the snaps, and it's more like in the high 60s into the 70s, maybe close to 80 percent. They actually just do a lot of different things up front, let him play fresh, let him stay fresh, and uh, basically maximize his snaps and and it allows him to create pressures i mean it's i haven't seen a, a Bengals defensive end play that well in a really long time uh and, and so he he's a guy that has been a, a big force for them but it's also been some of the additions they made in free agency over the past two off seasons in the interior of the defensive line um so they're playing really well and then all of that leads to sam hubbard the other edge player wow. have who's who's a nice a nice supplemental piece uh, and and he's playing some of the best football I've seen him play. So the defensive line is a big reason why. I mean, it's Joe Burrow, it's Jamar Chase, but this defensive line is really a big reason why they're playing well this year. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I just remember them wrecking Ravens' game last time, um, and I, I can't believe I forgot about that name, Sam Hubbard, but thank you for the friendly reminder. <laughs> You're um, now, uh, stay, staying on the defensive side, uh, speaking of Trey's, uh, Trey Wayne, how has be how has he been at cornerback for the Bengals this year when he's played? Well, when he's played is the is the operative phrase there. Yeah, I mean it's like it's been barely at all. This this unfortunately for all the stuff we can talk about, Trey Hendrickson, great free agency signing. Larry Ogunjobi, great free agency signing. You know all these guys. You look at Waynes, who was signed last year and the contract he signed, and even at the time before he took a snap for the team, everybody was like, you sure about that? You sure you want to pay that guy that much money? Yeah. Um, and so, but they felt that they made a good signing and it was going to be an upgrade, even if a marginal one from Drake Kirkpatrick and others that they had on the team. And unfortunately, just injuries. He's been a pretty healthy guy. At least he was on the Vikings. And, you know, when he came to Cincinnati, all of a sudden he can't get on the field. And so... Mm -hmm. Hasn't played well when he's been out there. He was uh, he led up a big play, I, I believe it was to LaVisca Chenault in the Thursday night game in week four against the Jaguars. That was like his first game back. Um, and then was kind of didn't do much of anything of note against Green Bay. Then he went on IR again, just came back uh, last week. And, um, and then this week against Denver, he had a missed tackle for loss that ended up netting a lot of yards and, you know, another, another play where he kind of got um, – pushed around a little bit on a touchdown to Tim Patrick. So yeah. it, it hasn't been good 
when Trey Waynes is in there. He'll probably they'll probably ease him back into the lineup a little bit to see how it goes. He's an important piece, and he needs to play well for this team going forward, but uh, it, it hasn't looked good when he's been in there at least this mm. year. So um, speaking of secondaries, we'll flip-flop to the Ravens secondary because – They've obviously been without Marcus Peters for the whole year, uh, but Marlon Humphrey, he's also out for the year. They lost their starting uh, free safety Deshaun Elliott for the year. Uh, Chuck Clark, he could play in this game um, if he comes off the COVID list in time, but basically the uh, the Ravens secondary, uh, it is physically in shambles. Um, Tavon Young, their starting slot corner, uh, he has been dealing with a concussion, so we'll see if he plays. Um, but with your big three, I mean, you throw in Azuma in there too. Um, I, I know. Wait a minute. I know. I said his last name wrong. How do you pronounce his last name again? The tight end, Uzama. Yeah. I think Uzama. There I think we it's go. Uzama. Uzama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you you throw him in there. It could be a big four. But going against the secondary, uh, Chase Boyd Higgins, um, how can they take advantage of just this beat up Ravens secondary? What are some things that they need to keep doing as a unit or what are some things that they may need to improve on uh, to really maximize the most of this opportunity? I, there are a lot of different things you can, you can look at here. I think the Bengals need to get into a rhythm early and they have been notoriously sluggish even in games where they pulled away the Ravens game, the Steelers games, all the, you know, those were tight games for a while. And mm -hmm. it, those were games that the Bengals really weren't making a lot of moves early in the game. The thing here's, here's what I would like to see if, if you're the Bengals offense. Um, I, I think they need a little bit of some semblance of offensive balance where they're able to get some timely runs from Joe Mixon and, and company there but I do think they need to exploit some of the injuries that, that the Ravens had. I, unfortunately, I, I, the name escapes me of the cornerback who was covering T. Higgins in the first game uh, from Baltimore, but the first couple of quarters. Oh, well, Anthony Avery probably. Yes, thank you. Anthony Avery, yes. Um, he, he played very – I was pretty impressed at what he was doing mm -hmm. against T. Higgins early in that game. Um, and so uh, T. Higgins has since really emerged. He, he had three straight 100-yard games out, out of the bye week and has played pretty oh. well. Um, so, you know, I, I think he needs to have a bounce back game of sorts based on what happened the first time in that game. And of course there's going to be attention paid to, to chase, I'm sure, but you know, being able to just kind of keep the, the Baltimore Ravens defense guessing a little bit, mm -hmm. offensive balance, being able to get some semblance of a run game going, spreading the ball around a little bit, getting, getting up early on the, on the team. And then there, there's one thing that uh, the Bengals were doing early in the season that they aren't doing as well this this time of year. That's getting points on that last possession right before halftime, and then if you're receiving the ball right out of halftime, getting points again. Um, mm -hmm. And so kind of sandwiching drives around halftime, we were able to get points and then points again, and that just really puts a team in a corner. So mm -hmm. uh, those are just a few of the facets on offense, I think, that are that are key. Okay. And as we wrap this up, Give me one thing from each team uh, that they would need to take advantage of in order to get the win. What was something that the Bengals would need to take advantage of? And what would be something that the Ravens could take advantage of to get a win over the Bengals? I don't know for the Bengals. I don't know if it's taking advantage of a certain situation. I will say that the Bengals, you know, for all the things I'm talking about that they need to execute on offense, the bottom mm -hmm. line is that offensive line needs to hold up. They need, ah. they need, to, they need to not let Burrow get – Three sacked three to five times and not get hit a bunch of times and pressured a bunch of times. They need mm -hmm. to keep that at a minimum. I believe that was the case in the first first game there. And because with those hits, sometimes Burrow puts it on himself by running into pressure or kind of playing backyard football a little bit. But when that happens, there tends to be the sack fumble. There tends to be all that kind of stuff. So the offensive line just needs to, to hold up and, and be able to create opportunities for that balanced attack on offense. And for the Ravens, I think it's just kind of the 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 opposite of of that. They need to be able to get some kind of play on defense that that gives them uh, with with all the absences gives them some hope. A big play, an interception for a touchdown, a fumble recovery, or something where they can say, you know what, we can we can still be in this game. We can still win this game despite all the absences that may be going on on the roster. Mm -hmm. Get those big plays on defense that have been such a trademark of so many different Baltimore Ravens teams over the years. Um, if yeah. they're able to do that, 
Um, I think I think it's then it's going to be an interesting and close close game. So uh, those are those are a couple of facets there. Again, I don't know if it's necessarily taking advantage, but um, those are a couple of areas that I think okay. they'll want to they'll want to work on. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, Ant, appreciate you coming on. Thank you for joining us, and um, we'll see how this thing goes. One more time before you get out of here, uh, let everybody know where they can find you at. All the stuff's on cincyjungle.com, part of the SB Nation Network, Orange and Black Insider, Bengals Podcast. That's on YouTube and on, on all major audio streamers. I'm on Twitter at CJAnthonyCUI. Tw uh, show Twitter is at Bengals OBI. And thank you for having me on. I've been a fan of what you do for a really long time. Seriously, you, I, I admire what you do in your channel and uh, appreciate how you've been a good friend to our show as well. So uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, no, no problem. No problem at all. Appreciate you hopping on in. May the best team win. We'll see how it goes. Be a good one. Oh, yeah.